Chapter 4 Early English Voyages to the Gold Coast, 1482 to 1592. Soon after the Portuguese had formed their settlement at Elmina, the king sent to Pope Sextus IV and obtained a confirmation of the bulls that had been granted to Prince Henry. This pope added an injunction strictly forbidding any Christian nation to disturb the Portuguese in the possession of the territory that he had bestowed upon them, and even decreed that if they should discover any fresh countries within the limits he had assigned to the Portuguese, these too should belong to them. At this time, the Pope's right to dispose of kingdoms was universally acknowledged, and his mandates were considered binding upon all European nations. Nevertheless, it appears that their violation was, on at least one occasion, seriously contemplated. In 1481, John II sent Re de as his ambassador to the English court. He was accompanied by his surgeon and secretary, Joan de Luas and Fernam de Pina, and had orders to confirm the ancient leagues with England and to inform Edward IV of the King of Portugal's title, the Guinea. He was to ask him to cause this to be published throughout his kingdom, so that none of his subjects might go there, and more particularly to request him to prohibit the sailing of two Englishmen named John Tintum and William Fabian, who were even then fitting out a fleet under the instructions of the Spanish Duke of Medina, Sidonia. With all these requests, Edward complied. John, however, was not entirely satisfied with these safeguards, and feared that if the great riches of the country became known, the greed of gain might be more than sufficient to counteract fear of the Pope's commands. He therefore spared no pains to keep the full extent of the Portuguese discoveries secret. He spread reports of the great difficulties to be encountered in making a voyage to Guinea, and alleged that each quarter of a moon produced a terrible storm that the people were cannibals, and that the shores were hedged around with dangerous rocks, and that such a voyage was, in fact, only possible at all in a ship of special construction which had been invented by the Portuguese. Hence it is that very little is known of the history of the Gold Coast during the earlier years of the Portuguese occupation and such knowledge as we have of the latter part of this period is mainly derived from the, account, the accounts of different voyagers who sailed there after the Pope's bull had come to be disregarded. It is known, however, that about the year 1500, John II formed a Guinea company, granting it a monopoly of the trade to the coast for an annual payment of a hundred pieces of gold and making it a capital offence for any of his subjects to trade there without its license. This company, for a time, made very great profits and set up new stations at Axim, Accra and Shama, and little later at Christiansborg, and probably at Cape Coast also. According to all accounts, the Portuguese treated the people very badly, though it would be unjust to place implicit trust in everything that is said of them by other nations, who were doing their utmost to deprive them of their trade and oust them from their possessions. It is certain, however, that they had frequent trouble with the people of different places, and had very little power outside the range of the guns of their forts, and that they often treated not only with the natives, but also any Europeans who fell into their hands with the utmost barbarity. The Gold Coast at this time was held to extend from the Rio de Suero da Costa, or the River Teno, on the west, to Ningo on the east. It was split up into a number of petty kingdoms and commonwealths lying along the seaboard, none of which extended any great distance inland commencing on the west, 
the country between the rivers Tino and Manco was known as Adue, and the kingdom of Ancoba lay between this and the Rio Cobre, that is, the river Ancobra. Next came Atsin, or Axim, which was bounded on the east at Acoda, Aquida, by the western frontier of Anti. Anti extended from this point to about a mile and a half east of Zaconde, Zaconde. Between this place and the Rio San Juan, the River Pra, were two more kingdoms, Adom or Little Incasan and Jabi. But on crossing the river, the kingdom of Komani, Commendo or Grafo, was entered. This stretched as far as the River Benya or Salt River at Elmina. The present coast town Commenda was called Little Kamani or Eki Toki, and it and the headland near it were known to the Portuguese as Aldeia de Terre. It is still called Ekitaki by the natives. The capital Eguafo, which was then a large town said to have contained about 400 houses, was distinguished as Comedy Grandi or Great Commendo. Fetu lay between the Benya and Queen Anne's Point, and Sabo between there and the Iron Hills. These last three seem to have been subdivisions of an earlier larger state, for Barbeau says the kingdoms of Commendo, Fetu and Sabo formerly constituted one kingdom called Adosenis. It is possible that the split may have occurred during the early years of the Portuguese occupation. Fantin, or Fanti, lay between the Iron Hills and somewhere between, somewhere near where a uh, salt pond now stands. From here to the Monte de Diable, the Devil's Mount at Winnebar, was Akron, and from there to Beracu, Aguna. The country lying between this and Ningo constituted the Kingdom of Accra. In the majority of these little states, the towns on the seaboard were mere villages, the inhabitants of which were employed in fishing and making salt to supply the larger inland towns. The capitals of their kings lay at some distance from the coast. When the Portuguese first settled in Elmina, the town was divided into two parts under separate kingdoms, one owing allegiance to the king of Eguafo and the other to that of Fetu. The Portuguese, however, encouraged them to assert their independence, and now that they had the castle to protect them, they established themselves as a separate republic. There were three town companies in Elmina at this time, and their chiefs ruled the town under the direction of the Portuguese governor. They had to submit their decisions and resolutions for his sanction, and his right to approve or reject them was jealously guarded and went far to maintain the local authority of the Portuguese. The people were also assisted when necessary to avenge any wrongs inflicted on them by the neighbouring tribes, and were thus kept trained to war and made formidable to their enemies. But though the Portuguese found it to their advantage to encourage and humour the Elminas, they treated the people elsewhere with very scant consideration. When the Guinea Company was first formed, the king caused the castle to be further fortified and well provisioned, and reserved to himself the right of appointing the governor and other principal officers. These appointments were made every three years, and were usually given to officers who had lost a limb, or in some other way become unfitted for further active service while fighting in the king's wars against the Moors of Fez. The chief officials besides the governor were the padre, or chaplain, the viador, or chief factor, the king's procurador, or judge, and the officer commanding the garrison. These and the company's chief clerk had quarters in the castle, but the soldiers, barber-surgeon, and others 
lived in the town beneath its walls, and only went there each day to do their work. The garrison was composed of criminals who had been banished there for life, and with such a rabble it is not surprising that discipline is said to have been very poorly maintained. Only the most negligent guard was kept, except when there were ships in the roads, when the sentries in helm and breastplate and armed with the heavy halberds might have been seen uh, pacing up and down the ramparts. Two fleets of four or five ships each used to arrive at El Mina in April and September every year, bringing merchandise and supplies for the garrison from Portugal. El Mina Castle, on account both of its position and design, was a fortress of no mean importance. The Portuguese had built two batteries on the side towards the sea and mounted them with six guns each. On the land side, there were another six-gun battery, but towards the northeast, facing the river Benya and the hill beyond it, it was only defended by two small pieces of ordnance. Towards the sea, it was strengthened by the lower bastion known as the Bastion de France, so the walls on this side were of no great height, but those to landward there were very lofty. The castle was surrounded by a deep ditch, but it was only on the side towards the sea that it contained any water. Here, however, it was deep enough to admit small boats. There were two gates, one on the east and the other on the west. The latter, which was the main entrance, was furnished with a drawbridge, and over it, in Dazambuja's original stone tower, were the governor's quarters. The other and lesser gate was next to the custom house, and was only used for passing goods in and out of the castle. Some time before 1555, the Portuguese built a little chapel on the hill overlooking the castle from the other side of the river Benya, and dedicated it to St. Jago. The hill itself still bears this name. A little later, between 1555 and 1588, a small watchtower was also erected there, and a stone wall with a gate in it, and defended by a deep ditch and several guns, was built across the neck of the peninsula on which the castle stands, extending from the sea to the river Benya. The first fort erected by the Portuguese at Axim was built on a little point on the shore, but they were so continually harassed by the natives that they were compelled to abandon it. In 1515, however, they built a second but far stronger fort on a small but high rock in the sea, which formed the rounded head of a peninsula and was only open to attack on the land side where it could be easily defended. This side was strengthened with breastworks, a ditch eight foot deep and a drawbridge, the approach to which was covered by several guns. There was also a spur capable of containing twenty men, with steps cut in the rock to connect it with the main building. This fort was named San Antonio. Though small and triangular in shape on account of the limited space afforded by the rock upon which it was built, it was, nevertheless, very strong and had two good batteries towards the sea in addition to the land defences already described. It mounted several large guns besides smaller pieces. The post at Shama was only built to supply the castle at Elmina with provisions and firewood. Little, if any, trade was carried on there, and the place was afterwards neglected and fell into decay. In 1554, the Portuguese had a dispute with the Shamas over a man they had stolen and drove them out of the town, fully half of which they demolished with their guns. The fort at Accra was built much against the wish of the people, who dreaded the tyranny of the Portuguese and were anxious to keep them out of their country. They therefore took steps to remove them at the first opportunity. In 1578, 
some traders having arrived from the interior, a number of the Akras went to the fort and having gained admission under a pretense of coming to trade, fell upon and murdered the garrison and razed the building to the ground. They subsequently invited the French to settle there, which they did, but were soon afterwards forced to abandon the place owing to the persistent hostility of the Portuguese. Until the time of the Reformation, the papal bull had ensured a monopoly of the Guinea trade to the Portuguese, but the change in religion had no sooner invalidated the Pope's authority in the eyes of other nations than they began to compete with them. According to the accounts that are still in existence, the English were the first to undertake trading voyages to Guinea. They were quickly followed by the French, however, and very soon afterwards by the Dutch also. These intrusions naturally aroused the bitterest enmity of the Portuguese, who left no stone unturned to drive the newcomers off the coast. It is from the accounts left of these early voyages, and principally from those of Towerson, that most of our knowledge of what happened on the Gold Coast at this period is derived. They were semi-piratical adventures in which ships were sent out by small syndicates of merchants, and the captains divided their time between a legitimate barter of goods for gold and ivory or slaves, and attacks upon one another. The first of these English voyages was made by Captain Thomas Wyndham and Antonio Anis Pintiado, who sailed in two ships, the Primrose and Lyon, and the Pinnace, the Moon, with total crews of 140 men. This Pintiado was a Portuguese, a native of the port of Portugal, Oporto, who, on account of his skill in navigation, had formerly been a gentleman in the king's household and very popular, but afterwards fell out of favour and came to England, resolved to bring the English on the scene to avenge his wrongs. He is described as having been a very able and prudent navigator and an expert pilot, and it is on record that he had previously been entrusted by the King of Portugal with the care of the coasts of Brazil and Guinea against the insults of the French. From this it appears that though there are no accounts of such voyages now extant, the French had made attempts to trade on the coast prior to this voyage, and if it is true that they had a prior claim to it, it may very well be that they did make efforts to re-establish themselves there after the civil wars, to which their former retirement is attributed. Wyndham, on the other hand, seems to have been a very ill-natured, quarrelsome and obstinate man, and to have taken great offence at the appointment of this Portuguese captain as his colleague. They sailed from Portsmouth on the 12th of August, 1553, Wyndham having first given a sample of his disposition by turning a relative of one of the principal merchants out of his ship. On reaching the Gold Coast, they carefully avoided Elmina, but traded along the shore, both to the east and west of it, and succeeded in obtaining £150 weight of gold. There was no lack of gold here, and they might easily have bartered the whole of their cargo for it, a course which Pintiado advised. Wyndham, however, who had commenced to quarrel openly with Pintiado soon after leaving Madeira, insisted upon going on to Benin for Guinea pepper, and when his fellow captain ventured to doubt the wisdom of this course owing to the lateness of the season, openly reviled and cursed him before the crew, saying, This whore son Jew have promised to bring us to such places as are not to be found, or he cannot bring us to. But if he do not, I will cut off his ears and nail them to the mast. They sailed on, therefore, to the Benin River. Pintiado and some of his crew then ascended it for some distance in the pinnace and saw the king, who treated them very well and sent out 
ordering his people to bring in large quantities of pepper. Wyndham, in the meantime, was becoming alarmed at the high rate of mortality among his crews and sent for them to return, to which they replied that now, they now had large quantities of pepper and daily expected more. They therefore begged him to wait a little longer. This so enraged Wyndham that he seems to have lost all control over himself. He broke up Pintiado's cabin, destroying his chests, instruments and other possessions, and then sent him word that if he and his party failed to come back at once, he would sail without them. Pintiado then hurried down and tried to make him listen to reason, but Wyndham himself now died, and several of the officers and uh, crew, after cursing Pintiado for having brought them to so deadly a place and even threatening his life, insisted on leaving the coast at once. It was in vain that Pintiado begged them to wait for those who were still up the river or to leave him one of the ship's boats and a sail to bring them home. Nothing would content them but that they must start at once and he with them. He therefore wrote to the men he had left, promising to come back later and fetch them, and was then forced on board and grossly ill-treated, being put with the cabin boys and half-starved. He died broken-hearted a few days later. The crews were now so reduced that they had to sink one of their ships for want of hands to sail her. And on their arrival in England, there were only 40 men left alive of the 140 who had set out. Nevertheless, the great quantity of gold that they had got in exchange for only a part of their cargo soon encouraged others to try their fortunes on a guinea voyage. One of the first of these was Captain John Locke, who sailed from the Thames on the 11th of October 1554 with three ships, the John Evangelist and Trinity of 140 tons each, and the Bartholomew of 90 tons. He also took two pinnaces, but lost one of them in a gale before he had cleared the channel. Passing Fort St. Anthony at Axim, which Locke calls Ara Castle, he reached Shammer on the 12th of January, uh, 1555. Here he says the natives fired on them with their ordnance, whereof they have only two or three pieces. This was a year after the Portuguese had their dispute with the Shammers and destroyed most of the town, so that they may have already abandoned their lodge, as these smaller fortified houses at outstations were called. In this case, the Shammers may have been making use of the guns they had left there, but it is far more likely that it was the Portuguese themselves who were firing. Sailing on, they reached Cape Korea, called Cabo Corso by the Portuguese and now anglicised the Cape Coast. The chief of this place was called Don John by the Portuguese. Hence the early writers often refer to it as Don John's town. The people here were very friendly and the English found a ready market for nearly all their cloth. In the meantime, the Trinity had been trading along the coast farther east, but the other ships now joined her, and they then traded in company as far as Beracu. While the Trinity was at Cormantin, the chief had come on board and invited the English to build a fort there, promising to give them land if they would do so. On the 13th of February, they turned homewards, and two or three days before reaching Cabo de Tres Puntas, Cape Three Points, sent the, the pinnace to trade along the shore. This time they seemed to have obtained a quantity of gold at Shama, where they had been uh, fired on on the outward journey, so that if the Portuguese were there, then they must have left it now. Possibly, as no trade was done there, no permanent garrison was maintained, but the place was only visited from time to time. The return voyage to England occupied not less than twenty weeks. They lost twenty-four men in all, most 
of whom died after they reached the colder latitudes and especially after passing the Azores. But they brought back over 400 pounds weight of gold, 36 butts of guinea grams, guinea grains, sorry, and about 250 elephants' tusks some of which measured as much as nine spans along the curve and were thick as a man's thigh and weighed 90 pounds apiece. The elephant seems to have caused them the greatest astonishment and they brought back a skull as a curiosity. The natives of the Gold Coast at this time are described by Locke as follows. Their princes and noblemen prounce and raise their skins in divers' figures like florid damask, and although they go in a manner all naked, yet many of them, especially their women, are, as it were, laden with collars, bracelets, hoops and chains, either of them gold, copper or ivory. Some wear one on each arm and leg, wherewith they are often so galled as to become in a manner lame yet they will by no means leave them off. Some wear also on their legs great shackles of bright copper, which they think to be no less comely. They likewise make use of collars, bracelets, garlands, and girdles of certain blue stones like beads. Some of their women wear on their bare arms certain force leaves made of plates of beaten gold, and on their fingers rings of gold wire with a knot or reef like that which children make in rush rings among other things of gold which the english had in exchange were certain chains and collars and chains for dogs they are very wary in bargaining and will not lose the least spark of gold they have weights and measures and are very circumspect in them Whoever would deal with them must behave civilly, or they will not traffic if they be ill-used. In 1555, Captain William Towerson made the first of his three voyages to the Gold Coast. This, as in the case of the preceding ones, was a trading venture, and two vessels, the Hart, John Ralph Master, and the Hind, William Carter Master, were engaged in it. Their cargo consisted principally of linen cloth and small basins. They left Newport in the Isle of Wight on the 30th of September 1555, and after trading for pepper and ivory higher up the coast, eventually reached Cape Three Points on the 3rd of January 1556, having passed Fort St. Anthony during the night. They found some difficulty at first in getting the people to trade with them, for they were all afraid of being punished by the Portuguese, who, now that they had found their trade declining, dealt severely with all those whom they caught buying from other nations, confiscating the goods and fining or enslaving the purchasers. At length, however, they anchored off a town which Towerson calls St. John's Town, this, from the description he gives of it, must have been Shammer, the name being given it because it stood at the mouth of the Rio San Juan, as the Portuguese called the Pra. Here they traded very profitably. The people gave the Portuguese a bad name. They said they used to catch natives whenever they could and keep them in irons as slaves in the castle at Elmina, and would certainly hang any English or French whom they caught trading on the coast. Towerson was also told that instead of the four or five ships every six months that formerly brought supplies to Elmina, only one ship and a small caravel now came once a year. This in itself is sufficient evidence of the disastrous effect that competition and the counteraction of their newly acquired commerce with the West Indies had had on Portuguese trade. These people wore cloth manufactured from the bark of trees, probably palms, and used cords and fishing lines of the same material. Some wore caps of this cloth, and others helmets made of skins, 
either basket-shaped or like a wide purse. They understood the working of iron and made spears, fish hooks, two-edged daggers and other articles of it. Some of these latter weapons were very sharp and curved like a scimitar. Their other arms consisted of spears and bows and arrows, and they carried shields made of bark. Having been told at Shama that Don John the Chief of Cape Coast was then at war with the Portuguese, they sailed down and anchored off his town. Cape Coast at this time consisted of only some 20 houses, which were enclosed by a rush fence about 5 foot high. The Fantis called this place Gua or Ogwa, and the local tradition says that it was founded by an Ifutu hunter of that name, who came down to the coast and first saw the sea from the hill on which the Wesleyan Chapel now stands. No boats coming off to them, they landed and were told that Don John had gone to the bush, but was expected back that night. Landing again the next day, they found he had not yet returned, but was expected hourly. Some men, however, had arrived in the meantime from the Viso, the town on Aquan Point, so called from its chief having been named John de Viso by the Portuguese. They had bought some gold to show Towerson and asked him to come down there and trade. He therefore went down in the Hind, or the Hind, sorry, and spent the next two days trading with them. This trade was carried on from the ship's boats, which lay off the shore, the people coming out through the surf in their canoes, but finding the natives kept pressing them to land, they suspected treachery and went back to the ship, whence they discovered thirty men on the hill with a flag, whom they took to be Portuguese. Towerson, therefore, went down in his boat to join the heart off the Cape Coast, but before he could reach her, she was seen to fire two guns, and her boats came hurrying off from the shore. Hastening on board, he learned that some of his men had been on shore negotiating with Don John and his sons to open trade, when a party of Portuguese suddenly came down from the hill and fired on them as they were making off in their boats. The people had tried to warn them of their danger, but they had not understood what they said and were taken completely by surprise. Guns were at once put into the boats, which were well manned and pulled towards the shore. The surf was too bad for them to land, so they lay off the beach and opened fire on the Portuguese, who had now taken up a position on the rocks. The fire was returned, but no one seems to have been hurt and as the Portuguese were seen to uh, be still in the town the next morning, they went down to rejoin the hind off the Viso. Here they found the Portuguese had punished the people for trading with them by burning their town, and only six houses were left standing. They therefore went farther along the coast until they came to a place which from the description given of it must have been Cormantin. The people here seemed afraid to trade, but in the evening the chief came down to the beach and Towerson sent him off with a present. Early the next morning they landed and rigged up a tent with their oars and sail and uh, while waiting for the people to come down. After a time the chief arrived, but though he appeared friendly enough, he was in reality betraying them into the hands of the Portuguese and trying to distract their attention from a crowd of his people who were standing in the opening of a narrow path and acting as a screen for the enemy while they got their gun into position. With this, they suddenly opened fire and before Towerson and his men could get the oars and sail into her, their boat and launch her, they had reloaded and fired a second shot. Fortunately, however, neither of them did any harm, and having now got their boat into the water, the English sprang her and pulled off to their ship as fast as they could, while the Portuguese fired two more shots at them, and the Cormantins also ran out along the rocks and poured into a volley or two. 
The cause of this treacherous attack by the Cormantins was that the year before, when Locke was on the coast, Robert Gainch, the master of the John Evangelist, had basely seized the chief's son and three other men who had come on board his ship to trade, stealing the gold they had bought with them and carrying them off to England. This disgraceful act had had the natural effect of turning the Cormantins against the English and making them friendly with the Portuguese, whom they had formerly hated. It was probably the cause of the unwillingness to trade that is uh, that was shown by the people of more than one place during this voyage, for the fact that these men had been kidnapped seems to have been well known all along the coast and the man had asked Towerson when he was at Shama what had become of them, and had been told that they were safe and well in England, and would return as soon as they learned enough of the language to be of use to the English in their trade. Had Gainch himself suffered for his treachery, he would have had only himself to thank for it. But, as it was, the vengeance of the people fell on Towerson, who seems to have been a most honourable man in his dealings with the natives, who afterwards became very fond of him, so that his bad fortune was quite unmerited. Nor were these his only troubles, for a Portuguese brigantine followed him wherever he went to warn the people against trading with him, but was herself too weak to risk an attack on his ships. In spite of all these difficulties, however, he managed to get a great quantity of gold before returning to England. A year later, in 1556, Towerson set out on his second voyage with three ships, the Tiger of 120 tons, the Heart of 60, and a 16-ton pinnace commanded by himself, John Skyer and John Davis. His experiences during his last voyage, however, had convinced him that he would have very little need to fear the Portuguese if he could but secure the goodwill of the natives. Before leaving Plymouth, therefore, he arranged to take back the men whom Gainch had kidnapped in 1554. They sailed on the 15th of November and had got as far as the Cess River when they sighted three other ships. Thinking they might be Portuguese, they at once cleared for action, but on coming up with them, they found that the strangers were Frenchmen. On learning each other's uh, nationality, the Frenchmen inquired what Portuguese the English had seen, and were told none but fishermen. The French, however, reported that several Portuguese ships had recently been sent out to Elmina to protect the trade and that they themselves had taken and burned another of 200 tons only a short time ago, saving only her captain, one or two negroes and a few of the crew. But they had all been so severely burned that they had put them ashore at the Cess River. The French officers came on board Towerson's ship and proposed that the two fleets should continue their voyage in company. Towerson and his officers carefully weighed the advantages and disadvantages of this arrangement and next day dined on board the French flagship and agreed that to whatever place they came, they should be of one mind and not hurt each other's market. To which end some of their boats should settle the price for all and then one boat makes sail for each ship. Having doubled Cape Free Points, they arrived on the 15th of January 1557 at a town standing on the shore of a bay. This, which they call Bull, was probably Butry or perhaps Dick's Cove. The inhabitants were very pleased to see the Cormantins they had now brought back with them and told them that there had been more than one fight recently between the Portuguese guardships and some other French vessels that were down the coast. From here they went to Hanta, which, from the sailing distances given, may have been Sakondi or Takaradi, where they heard that there were five ships and a pinnace then at Elmina. 
The Cormantins they had brought back with them were well known here, and they consequently were very well received. On the 17th, they anchored off of Shammer, and putting guns in their boats, landed with drums beating and trumpets sounding, fully expecting to encounter some of the Portuguese. In this, however, they were agreeably disappointed and were able to do a good trade in peace. They promised the chief protection from the Portuguese and fired their guns and shot with their longbows in order to give him some idea of their power, which greatly astonished and impressed him. All this time, they had been keeping a sharp lookout for the Portuguese and always went ashore prepared for battle and expecting to be attacked. But though they heard some shots in the forest nearby, which must have been fired by the Portuguese to frighten the Shamas and deter them from trading, they were evidently not strong enough to risk an engagement and never showed themselves. Towerson, therefore, lay at anchor here for some time, sending his boats every day to trade at the different villages along the beach. About a week had been spent in this way, when on the 23rd, the Shamas warned them that the Portuguese ships had left Elmina and were coming down to attack them. The English and French thereupon fired their guns and sounded their trumpets, while the Shamas implored them to show the Portuguese no mercy. Two days later, five Portuguese ships were sighted coming towards them, and the boats were at once recalled, but when night closed in, the enemy was still a long way off, and in the morning they were seen at anchor. White scarves were then served out to all the English crew, so that the French might distinguish them in case of boarding, and that uh, and at night that night they anchored just out of range of the enemy. Next morning, both fleets weighed anchor at about seven o'clock, and the fight commenced. The Portuguese seemed to have outmaneuvered the ships of the Anglo-French fleet, besides having the faster vessels and the better ordnance. They sailed past in succession and riddled the French flagship with their broadsides and carried away her mainmast. Neither was the tiger able to make a good shot at any of them because she was so weak in the side that she lay all her guns under the water. The tiger and the Frenchman tried to run alongside and board some of the enemy's ships, but they were too fast for them and sailed too close to the wind so that they fell away to leeward and were left behind. The other French ships would not close and the heart lay far astern. The tiger, therefore, seeing the French flagship was disabled, crowded on all her canvas and gave chase. Having followed the enemy out to sea for two hours, they suddenly put out and uh, fired on her as they passed. All the other French and English ships had now sailed away to sea, but Towerson still held bravely on in pursuit of the Portuguese, in order to prevent them from boarding and capturing the disabled Frenchmen. As they passed the latter, they each poured in broadside, but the Tiger being still close astern, they dared not stop to board her and seemed afraid to separate. After they had passed the Frenchman, she, lay, she too lay as close as she could to the wind and followed the rest of the Allied fleet out to sea. The tiger was thus left in the lurch, but Towerson handled her so well that though the Portuguese tacked over and over again, he always contrived to keep the weather of them so that it was useless for them to fire on her. These tactics were maintained until it was so dark that in the end she lost them. Next day, Towerson came up with the other English and French ships, except the French vice admiral's ship, Lurier which had fled clear away and upbraided them with having deserted him. Most of them, however, were in a sorry plight, having lost many of their men and sustained other serious damage. The pinnace indeed had been so badly knocked about that they had to take off with her crew and set her on fire. Ten days later, when they had resumed their trade, one of the Cormantins whom they had brought out with them came in a canoe 
having followed them for thirty leagues, and told them that after the battle, which he had watched from the shore, the Portuguese had put into the pra, but the chief of Shama had refused to allow them to harbour there. Two men had been killed on one of their ships by a shot from one of the tiger's guns. They now seemed to have returned to the Ivory Coast, where they found trade very bad for a time, the people at some places wanting too much for their gold, while at other places uh, difficulties arose out of their preference for the French cloth, which was a little wider and of slightly better quality than that which Towerson had brought out with him. The French and English ships, therefore, separated, the French remaining where they then were, and the English going farther east to the Gold Coast again. But a few days later, one of the French ships rejoined them and complained that they could do no good where they had been left, but Towerson fired on her and drove off, drove her off, sorry. He now obtained plenty of gold for a time, and among other places, seems to have uh, put in at Commenda and sent some of his men to visit the king at Eguafo. Later, they arrived at Maori, but found the place deserted and heard soon afterwards that the people had removed to Lagua, or Legu, probably to be farther from the Portuguese. On their way back to Shama, they saw the five Portuguese ships with which they had fought lying at anchor off Elmina, and before returning to England were chased by another Portuguese fleet of two ships of 200 and 500 tons, and a pinnace which had just arrived on the coast. Five days after passing Cape Verde on the homeward voyage, they were again attacked by a French ship but gave her such a warm reception that she soon drew off, badly damaged and having lost a number of her men. A French trumpeter on board the tiger, though lying ill in bed, yet on this occasion took his trumpet and sounded until he could sound no more, and so died. The men who were sent to Eguafo, or whatever place this inland town was, brought back a wonderful tale of what they had seen, part of which, at any rate, was an obvious invention or exaggeration, for they said it appeared to them to be as large as London, which, though a comparatively small place in 1556, contained more than 400 houses, which was all there were in Eguafo. They said they saw about a thousand ricks of corn and millet, and that the people kept strict watch there every night, and have cords with bells at them, stretched across the ways which lead into town, so that if any one touch the cords, the bells ring, and then the watchmen run to see who they are. If they be enemies, and pass the cords, they take them by letting fall nets, hung for that purpose over the roads, which they are obliged to pass for there is no getting otherwise to the town, by reason of the thickets and bushes which are about it. It is also walled round with long cords, bound together with sedge and bark of trees. Towerson's third and last voyage was made in 1558 in the Minion, Christopher and Tiger, and a pinnace named the Unicorn. They had no sooner arrived on the coast and begun to trade at Hunter than they were attacked the very next day by five Portuguese ships. A running fight ensued, but no great damage was done on either side. At Legu, they heard that there were four French ships farther down the coast, one at Perenin, another at Wiamba, Winneba, a third at Perico, Beracu, and the fourth at Egrand. Accra, and England being then at war with France, they decided to go down and attack them. They soon sighted one of the Frenchmen coming out of Winneba and gave chase, and the next day found three of the enemy together at anchor, one of which, the mullet, they boarded and took. She had fifty pounds, five ounces of gold on board. And when they had removed this and all her cargo, they tried to sell her back to the French. But they would not pay anything for her, 
because she was leaky, so they sunk her off Accra. The ships now cruised singly along the coast, but met with very small success, and at Mori and Cape Coast, the people refused to trade with them at all. At Cape Coast, the inhabitants fled into the bush, and the English took several of their goats and fowls. But when they landed at Mori, they were stoned, and on returning the next day to get ballast, numbers of people attacked them and tried to drive them on board again. Several of the natives were killed in this affray, and the town was then burnt. The ships were now running short of provisions, so they returned to Shama and Hunter. But the chief of Shama had now come to terms with the Portuguese, and refused to supply them with anything. And they, in revenge, burnt his town also. They did very little better at Hunter, for the people here would not trade with them either so they concluded they were not likely to gain anything by remaining any longer on the coast, and returned to England. When Towerson was at Commenda, the king of Eguafu had asked him to send men and materials to build a fort in his country, and in 1561 a syndicate calling themselves the Company of Merchant Adventurers for Guinea, and consisting of Sir William Gerard, William Winter, Benjamin Gonson, Anthony Hickman, and Edward Castellan decided to send John Locke out in the Minion to choose a site near the sea and report on the possibility of accepting this invitation. The Minion, however, was an old ship and had been badly strained in a gale on her last voyage home, and John Locke told the company that even though she had been repaired, He did not consider her seaworthy, nor did he believe that any amount of patching would ever make her so. He therefore refused to sail in her, and the project fell through. A year later, however, in 1562, the Minion and Primrose were sent out by this syndicate, but their misfortunes fully justified the predictions of Locke. They were unable to trade anywhere on the Gold Coast, for the Portuguese ships followed them to Cape Coast, Mori, Cormantin, and wherever else they went, and continually harassed them. The favourite method of attack with the Portuguese was in galleys, in which they could creep up under a ship's stern as she lay becalmed and helpless, and take her at a disadvantage. These galleys carried a gun in the bow and had eighteen oars on either side. Uh, to each of which free slaves were chained. Many of these wretched galley slaves were English or Frenchmen who had the misfortune to fall into the hands of the Portuguese and now had to spend the remainder of their short lives sitting in the broiling sun and tugging at the oars with nothing to keep up their strength but a minimum quantity of the coarsest food and little or no hope of rescue or escape. Two men used to run up and down between the rows of slaves carrying rips with which to lash them to greater exertions, and in the stern were a number of harquebusiers and crossbowmen. During the action off of uh, Cormantin, the minion was attacked by two such galleys which crept up under her stern, where they were safe from her guns, while every shot from their old from their own bow gun told. At last, by dint of great exertions, the minion's crew managed to get a demi culverin into position on the stern, and during the next hour did great damage to the Portuguese. Many of them and the slaves were either killed or wounded, and a crossbow shot broke nearly every oar on one side of the galleys, so that though the minion had lost several of her men, she was fully holding her own when a barrel of powder suddenly exploded in the steward's room, injuring not only him, but the chief gunner and nearly all his men as well. On this, the Portuguese raised a shout of triumph, for the English were now dependent on their small arms only, not having enough gunners left to work the gun. Soon after this, a lucky shot from one of the galleys carried away the foremast, and the Portuguese gave another great shout, thinking that now they must surely take the ship. Instead, uh, sorry, indeed, 
crew of the minion had almost given themselves up for lost when one of the white galley slaves called out to them in English not to give up as it was better to die like men than to lead a dog's life as a slave. Thereupon one of the Portuguese ran up to him and lashed him with his whip until the blood streamed down his shoulders and back, which so enraged the English that they swore they would never surrender and poured in a close uh, shower of arrows which killed both the wretched slave and his brutal assailant. Determined though they were, however, they could not have held out much longer. For the ship's stern was riddled and shot, and fully half her crew were either killed or disabled. But one of the Portuguese ships, for some unknown reason, now sent a boat to recall the galleys, and they, with half their oars broken and the forts encumbered with dead and dying slaves, pulled slowly away. With the help of the Primrose's crew, a jury mast was rigged, and the ships, finding it impossible to trade on the Gold Coast, sailed away. The Primrose soon afterwards lost five men through the capsizing of her pinnace, and by the time they reached England, they had lost 21 men dead, and so many others had been disabled that there were only 20 left to work the ships, while even they were so ill and weak that they could scarcely drag themselves about. In the November of the following year, 1563, several merchants fitted out two ships, the John Baptist, Lawrence M Rondel Master, and the Merlin, Robert Ravel Master, and sent them down the west coast to trade. They had not gone far when they fell in with two French ships, one of which they boarded and captured, selling her cargo at Groin in Spain. Having arrived on the coast, Robert Baker the factor of the John Baptist, and eight men went to trade along the shore in their boat, intending to return before night, but a tornado unexpectedly coming up, the ships dragged their anchors and were blown out to sea, and the boat's crew were forced to seek safety along the shore. The next day, the ships returned to pick up their boat, but partly on account of the haze and partly because they had mistaken each other's direction, they missed her altogether and after cruising up and down for three days, concluded that she must have swamped and returned to England. Thus stranded, Baker and his companions, having been without food for three days, landed and brought some yarns and other provisions with some of their goods and then continued their search for the ships. In this way, they spent twelve days, living on yams, coconuts, palm wine, fish and honeycomb, which they occasionally got from canoes that came off to them, but failing to see any sign of their ships, they concluded that it would be useless to spend any more time in looking for them and began to consider what they had best do. They saw at once that it would be hopeless to attempt to sail their boat home without provisions and realised that it would be equally out of the question for them to remain in her much longer. Exposed as they were to all weathers by day and by night, they could not last long. Indeed, they were already so cramped that they could scarcely stand and were beginning to be afraid that they would lose the use of their limbs. Scurvy had also broken out amongst them. Baker, who had been factor of the minion when she was attacked off of Cormantin, and consequently knew what to expect, now suggested three possible courses. First, they might go to Elmina and surrender to the Portuguese, when the worst that could have happened to them would be to be hanged and so have an end put to their misery, or, if they were made galley slaves for life, which was the most they could hope for, they would at any rate be supplied with food and drink. Another possible course was to throw themselves on the mercy of the natives, but they knew very little about them and were afraid they might be cannibals who would kill and eat them forthwith, while, even if they escaped this fate, 
they thought it would be very doubtful if they would be able to exist on their diet and endure the hardships they must suffer from want of clothing and other inconveniences to which they had never been accustomed. Their only other course would be to stay in the boat, which they had already decided was impossible. Baker, therefore, recommended that they should go to the Portuguese, from whom, as white men and fellow Christians, they might reasonably hope for better treatment than they could expect from the pagan Africans. Everyone having agreed to this proposal, they started to row to Elmina, but seeing a light ashore during the night and thinking there must be some trading down there, a trading town there, they anchored until daybreak and then pulled in towards the beach. They saw a watch house with a large black wooden cross in front of it standing on a rock and beyond this a castle. This proved to be the Portuguese fort San Antonio at Axim, of the existence of which they seemed to have been ignorant. Some Portuguese now came out of the fort and one of them, carrying a white flag, beckoned to them to come on shore, but though they had been bold enough at a distance, the sight of the Portuguese, now that they had reached them, caused the boat's crew to regret their decision to surrender, and they tried to make off. The Portuguese, however, seeing their intention, fired one of their guns, the shot of which fell within a yard of the boat, and they, having no means of resistance, then pulled towards the beach as fast as they could. The nearer they drew to the shore, however, the more furiously did the Portuguese fire on them until they got under the castle wall where they were out of reach of the guns. They were about to land when they were greeted with a shower of stones from the walls of the fort and saw the natives coming down with their bows and arrows. Several of them had been wounded by the stones hurled down at them by the Portuguese. So they turned around again in sheer desperation and once more tried to escape out to sea. Four men rowed while the others snatched up their bows and firearms and turned them against the enemies. Having dropped several of the axims, they now began to shoot at the Portuguese whom they saw standing on the walls of the fort in long white shirts or gowns, many of which were soon dyed red by the means of the English arrows. They were still near enough to the fort to be safe from its guns, and had already discovered that there were no galleys in the place that might be sent out to take them. They could therefore afford to laugh at the threats of the Portuguese, and held their ground until they thought they had sufficiently punished them for their want of hospitality. They then rode off, and although they were greeted with another storm of shot as soon as they entered the fire zone of the fort, got clear out to sea without receiving any damage. They had now uh, had more than enough of Portuguese charity and decided to sample that of the natives. Having sailed about 30 leagues from Axim, they anchored off a town somewhere in the neighbourhood of Gran Bassam, where some of the people came off to them in canoes. Baker gave each of them a present, and the chief's son then came out to them, to whom they explained by signs that they had lost their ship and were starving. They were invited to land, but in doing so, their boat capsized on the surf. The people, however, swam out and not only rescued them, but brought the boat and oars and all their goods safely to shore also. They were then kindly received and food was brought to them. For a time, they were liberally supplied with everything, and Baker seems to have expect, expected the people to feed and wait upon them for an indefinite period, and complains because they did not do so. A, a European-built boat, with a sail and oars and the goods that had been in her, must have represented an almost fabulous sum to these people, and should have amply repaid them for anything they did. But when they found the time slipping by and no ships came, as they had expected, they gradually reduced the supplies and forced the castaways to shift for themselves. The latter then suffered great hardships, but did not seem to have been very resourceful, for they made no attempt to build themselves a hut or make a farm.
but slept around a fire on the bare ground and subsisted on any roots or berries that they could find growing wild. This kind of life soon told on them, and six of the nine died, one after the other. But Baker, George Gage, and one other survivor were ultimately rescued by a French ship, and as England and France were still at war, were carried back to France and imprisoned. The Portuguese were now thoroughly exasperated by the damage that was done to their trade by the continual presence of English and French ships on the coast and took the uh, severest measures to discourage them. In 1564, when the Minion was sent out again, they took her commander, George Carlet, and a merchant and twelve seamen prisoners and drove the ship off the coast. And in 1582, their guard ship sunk a deeper ship, La Esperance, killing most of her crew and making the rest prisoners. They also offered a reward of 100 crowns for every Englishman or Frenchman's head that was brought to Elmina, which led the natives to kill a great many, whose heads were then stuck on pikes, sorry, spikes on the castle walls. All prisoners taken were either hanged or kept in chains to work as galley slaves for life. But this last was their usual fate, for the Portuguese had no authority to execute without a special warrant from the King of Portugal, though it is probable that they did not hesitate to exceed their powers when it suited them to do so. The only exception to this rule was in the case of slaves who were caught attempting to escape, and a Frenchman who was thus, take, who was thus taken was blown from one of the guns. The Portuguese on the Gold Coast itself were still far too weak to be able to effect much unaided, but they now had an extensive trade with the East Indies, and the passing fleets used to help the local authorities. In 1588, too, Queen Elizabeth granted a charter to the merchants of Exeter to trade in Senegal and Gambia, and in 1592, another concession was given for the trade between Cape Nunez and Sierra Leone. These charters, by providing fresh and less dangerous fields for their enterprise, combined with the barbarous treatment meted out to them by the Portuguese, quickly reduced the number of Englishmen who would venture to the Gold Coast, until in the end, these voyages ceased altogether. The Portuguese would never open their warehouses until 40 or 50 marks of gold had been bought, and if any of it was found to be mixed with base metal, the offender was immediately put to death or enslaved. Besides punishing any of the people whom they caught trading with the English or French, they often seized quite innocent persons and either compelled them to work for them or sold them as slaves. The slave trade, in fact, made the early history of the Gold Coast, and though the English were at one time as actively engaged in this traffic as any other nation, they were the last to embark in it, and in the end not only abandoned it themselves but made great efforts to abolish it altogether. Slaves had been taken from West Africa to Portugal as early as 1434, but it was not until the Spaniards in 1470 began to import slaves into Spain, the Canary Islands, and later into the West Indies also, that this trade began to assume large proportions. There was some opposition in 1503 to the importation of slaves into the West Indies on account of the great number of them who escaped into the woods and formed themselves into dangerous predatory bands. But the rapid decrease in the number of Indians who died in enormous numbers under the cruel treatment of the Spaniards, and indeed seemed likely to become extinct, rendered the importation of Africans to replace them absolutely necessary. In 1517, this traffic in human beings received the formal sanction of the Pope, which at once established it on a firm basis, so that by f uh, 1539 the annual sales had risen to over 10,000. The papal bull by which the Spaniards were excluded from Africa, 
did much to bring other nations into the slave trade. For the demand increased and the profits became proportionately greater, so the international competition for the Spanish contract became more and more keen. The slaves were employed in the mines and on the sugar plantations and also as divers in the pearl fisheries. These unfortunate people, as well as the Indians themselves, were often treated with the utmost cruelty, and Las Casas, the Bishop of Chiapa, who was styled the protector of the Indians and had himself advocated the establishment of a regular system of importing slaves in order to save the remaining Indians, mentions an instance of the inhuman treatment meted out to them. He says, I once beheld four or five principal Indians roasted at a slow fire, and as the victims poured forth screams which disturbed the commanding officer in his slumbers, he sent word that they should be strangled. But the officer on guard, I know his name, and I know his relations in Seville, Sevilla, would not suffer it, but causing their mouths to be gagged, that their cries might not be heard. He stirred up the fire with his own hand and roasted them till they all expired. I saw it myself. The English took no part in this trade until 1562, when Captain, afterwards Sir, John Hawkins engaged in it on his own account, fitting out three ships and obtaining 300 slaves in Guinea, which he sold in the West Indies and although Queen Elizabeth expressed her disapproval on his return, saying, if any Africans should be carried away without their free consent, it would be detestable and call down the vengeance of heaven on the undertaking. The prohibition, whether sincere or not at the time, was soon afterwards withdrawn, for the Queen lent Hawkins one of her own ships, the Jesus, for a slaving voyage in 1564, and granted him a coat of arms in which a negro loaded with chains appeared. In 1562 or 1563, an act was passed legalising the purchase of Africans, though few Englishmen, if any, seemed to have availed themselves of the permission. Their efforts to establish colonies in North America had not yet met with sufficient success to create a demand for slaves, and it was not until some years later, after 1660, that the English slave trade seriously began. In 1580, Portugal had become a province of Spain under Philip II, and these African possessions were much neglected for those in America. These still further damaged the Gold Coast trade, and as the profits decreased, the king reduced the supplies sent to Elmina, so that in the course of a few years the garrison became very much weakened and poorly provisioned, thus paving the way for its fall soon afterwards.